Once upon a time, there was a group of dads who started playing D&D. This is their story. Hello and welcome to D&D with Dads. We are back. Minus one. Um, Humphrey is indisposed at the time, so he will be played by me. Uh, but the rest of you all, introduce yourself and your characters. Ready, set, go. We'll start with Eric. Hey, uh, so I am Durant Mullerkin. Uh, I am a cleric of uh, Denaire and Knowledge Domain. And uh, yeah, I do all kinds of knowledge trickery things. Right on. And Mikey. I'm Mike, and I am playing Ezra Feinbark, the forest known druid, who is fairly old for this group. Uh, he is kind of like the old man of the group, uh, but he's very young of heart, and he very much enjoys his food and wine. Yes, indeed. Andy. Yep, I am Andy Hopkins. Uh, I go by Healed by Wounds on on. Uh, Bill's Discord and YouTube channel, and I play Riff Maelstrom, a half-elf bard, uh, actor, singer, uh, entertainer extraordinaire. He goes by many names, wears many different outfits, and um, just loves to have fun, usually at Durant's expense. <laughs> and Dave. Hey, I'm uh, playing Tuka Musashi. Uh, he's a whirling dervish with a Nevis uh, custom build from Bill. Uh, he's a barbarian fighter rogue and loves using his swords. And um, once we, uh, we for, for those who haven't caught the entire series, let me summarize. This campaign has been going on for a while through Patreon and um, it is set in the Forgotten Realms. And you guys are, are basically, um, what started as uh, something set in the vast, you have kind of headed to the north of the vast and um, you, are, you are kind of exploring a new region north of where a lot of your previous adventures had taken place. Um, and, and while in this, this region, you uh, have been kind of researching and finding out information about a couple kind of enigmatic places, um, one of which is the, the Mage's Tower, which is kind of what brought you up here. Um, your patron slash frenemy Shem Tetra um, is, is drawn to this mage's tower and has an intent to find out whether or not it can be accessed and possibly raided. Um, another intent for coming up to the north uh, was finding land and establishing kind of a base of operations for Shem to further uh, develop his idea to hatch a dragon egg. Uh, and then lastly, you have the flooded forest, which is kind of this vast swampy area uh, north of the small village of Tavala. While you were been in this area, you, you heard about um, some, some rumors concerning uh, a legend rather that pertained to a sleeping king or sometimes you you heard it as the king who sleeps. Um, and you, you began to unravel this mystery about this sleeping king and the fact that it, it could be a real person or thing um, who dwells atop the highest peak of a solitary mountain within the Troll Mountain range. You guys um, also had some other leads in this regard, Riff, has had on more than one occasion a strange affinity with um, wind and air, the elemental forces related to this. You guys basically found within the Troll Mountains, you found this solitary uh, tallest peak within that range and initially started to head up outside of that mountain but you encountered a lot of flying resistance. Fortunately, you were clever enough to charm them, the harpies, that is. They led you to an interior means of ascending the mountain, um, which you came to find out 
was known as the Stone Stairs. Um, your first encounter was with a uh, rather neutral stone giant who was kind of the, the, uh, the keeper of the gate, so to speak. Um, you, you were diplomatic in your interactions with him and you were therefore able to learn a little bit about the different levels that the stone stairs will provide you access to. Um, and you came to understand that from that foyer where you encountered the stone giant, that there were 12 more levels above you. Um, you went up, you encountered trolls, you defeated the trolls and you found this immense troll horde. And um, a lot of you guys took some pretty heavy hits, if I recall cor correctly, and a lot of spells, a lot of spells were used. But uh, ultimately, you were able to, to survive. You were able to kind of explore and loot through some of the things that you found in the troll horde. Um, one of those things particularly caught Rift's attention. Um, and it is there that we will now begin tonight's session. So you guys have collectively decided, right, that you are not comfortable just taking a, a sleep in this troll cavern. Um, so what is your plan? Where are you going to go? And what are you going to do to uh, rest and recuperate? So, yeah, Riff, um, Riff uh, has an idea for um, how we can rest up. We talked about possibly going back down to the, uh, the stone giant to go there because we feel that's safe. But uh, Riff found out that he had, he had studied something fairly recently, um, a spell called Leoman's Tiny Hut, which will actually serve as a good spot for us to have a nice long rest anywhere almost, or even right here in the, the stinky troll cave. So Riff is going to, it's, uh, I guess it's a, cast, a ritual kind of spell. Yes, and um, you guys are kind of amazed at the completion of this ritual as Rift creates this, this kind of strange half sphere that sits just at, at, at the ground level, but is more than ample space. Um, and you notice that the kind of exterior at first is, is very clear, like you're just looking through glass, but then it kind of swirls it almost takes on like a stony appearance and it almost blends in perfectly with the rocky kind of cave-like interior within the mountain. Um, when Rift beckons you inside, you are able to come in. And once inside, um, you were able to see outward as if there was no obstruction, but the exterior is completely kind of camouflaged in this dull gray rocky kind of appearance and you guys find yourself inside of this magical half sphere uh, with ample space and it it seems to be comfortable um humphrey immediately looks at you and he's like oh, thank you so very much riff this has been uh very, very helpful i must now sleep so if you'll excuse me and he he takes his bedroll out of his backpack and just makes a pillow and like lays down. Um, what do the rest of you do? Uh, Durant's going to walk up to Riff uh, and he's going to say, this is a very nice thing you've created here. I, I think I understand uh, what you felt when you mentioned the wind on the back of your neck. I think it happened to me in this cavern and uh, it's a little disconcerting, I have to be honest. Dis disconcerting in what way? Well, why would it happen to me? Why does it happen mm -hmm. to you? Don't you have something on your back of your neck or something? I do, check it out. Where you're feeling like the wind? Uh, yeah, yeah, I was born with this, um, this sort of like hurricane or storm shaped birthmark on the back of my neck. It's an ugly mole. 
And, is um, there anything yeah. on Grant's neck now? Uh, I'll turn around and show my neck. <laughs> There's nothing there. Hey, but come over closer, guys, because I did want to show you this box. I don't know if everyone had a chance to look at it that I found in the uh, ruins. And Riff turns it around and shows them that DM initials are carved on the bottom and um, takes the, the, the two-sided scroll that had sort of an image, I guess it was a silhouette, right, of a young boy with um, round ears on one side and another young boy with slightly pointed ears on the other and uh, shows the guys. Um, you guys, I might know who this box belonged to. Uh, I know you guys think of me as an extraordinary adventurer, entertainer, very flashy. But I have to admit that there was a time before where uh, I was a kind of a different person, not as glamorous and mysterious. It's hard, it's hard to admit this, of course. Um, you guys know me as Riff Maelstrom. But before then, I was actually R at Maelstrom. Different spelling, same sounding word. Um, and I was a, an apprentice to a master woodworker named Dak Maelstrom. Um, this looks like it could be some of his fine workmanship. Um, and you may have noticed that, yes, technically, he was also my father. Uh, I, I hesitate to say that because he, uh, he left me uh, when I was a baby uh, in a forest known village, which is actually where I met Estra, for all you guys who wondered. Um, and he left me there for, for five years before he came and picked me up and took me with him and immediately started apprenticing me and woodworking. And ultimately, we traveled with actors and musicians. We would create their stage decorations for them, this kind of thing. That's where I got a love for acting and singing and performing of all types. So it's not outside the ring of possibility that this could have been his. And I suppose it's possible that the image of the young boy with 20 years could have been me, which of course raises the question then who was the guy with the rounded ears? Um, and, oh, my dad was human, by the way. That's kind of important for you to know. He either had to be elf or human. I know you think that much. Anyway, um, I kind of want to look around a little bit more uh, before we leave here in case I can find anything else because if this was back, you know, was he attacked by trolls? Is he dead, alive? Why is his stuff here? So before we leave, I, I kind of want to do a more thorough search. So yeah. Um, but you must know where you came from. We will find solve this mystery with you. Thank you. I very much appreciate that. And I know some of you guys were wondering how I knew Estrof in the first place. And that's where it started. And Estrof, I don't know if you knew any of this about, about when my dad came and picked me up and I left. Um, if you were there and aware of it. but Yeah, would I be a part of that? Or did we just kind of stumble across each other while he stayed around? <clears throat> so you, you were old enough to remember that. Um, because Arik left, uh, yeah, you would have, you would have been around. He, Arik was there basically for five years. So his memory of, of the Ballywick where your, your particular clan was from the, the forest gnome kind of village, um, his memory would be very hazy because he was only there until he was five years old. Um, you don't necessarily remember this human father picking up the boy, but you remember the boy. You remember that there was a family in your bailiwick that took care of this little human boy. And I probably had more interest in the boy as I played, you know, Little illusions and right. stuff, making and, making him laugh. And he was kind of like, 
you know, a, a mascot for a lot of the forest gnomes. Like everybody kind of thought he was this, you know, interesting little, you know, human boy. Um, and as he started to get older, when he was about four, he started to show some of the elvish features with his ears. Um, and, and, but you don't remember the man who came to pick him up. You just remember like that, you know, the family who had been kind of, who had taken care of him in foster care had been pretty, you know, um, pretty subdued and discreet about the circumstances under which this human man had picked him up. You knew that it was like the boy's father, but you didn't know the details. I was definitely influenced a lot more heavily by Estroth in my, my first few years, obviously, than, than my father. So how did you get up again later? Because you were uh, a party. Mutual, yeah. Yeah, I mean, you know, over the years we we would run into each other here and there. I I did a lot of traveling um, with my own entertainment troupe. And then when I wasn't off on other adventures, like sailing with the, the feared Buccaneer Edwards and other stuff that I won't bore you about now. Yeah, and I stayed still. So, I mean, he just probably just circled right back around at some point. Riff, if you happen to find his remains among those here, I might be able to arrange a brief chat. He'll answer five questions if that's what you desire. So you're saying if I find dead dad, we can have a dialogue. That's kind of creepy. I mean, if you want. But, yeah, well, thank you for that. I'll definitely keep it in mind. Um, I actually won't be able to go investigate anymore until after our rest, because if I leave this cute little sphere here, um, it will go bye-bye. You guys can come and go as you want. Um, that's fine. But I need to stay inside, otherwise the spell will dissipate. Um, so yeah, so we can we can rest now if you want. I actually have, I actually speaking of Estroth, I kind of wouldn't mind um, finally performing the Ballad of Estroth Pinebark for you guys as we start resting. <laughs> oh, it's kind of a it's kind of a short, silly, but also a good recap of kind of where we started and where we are now. Two folks guys. not know much about you guys. I would love to hear. Okay. Now, I will invite everybody in to join me on the last refrain. So when I say everybody, you'll know that if you're comfortable lending your, your uh, instruments, you know, your vocal cords, join right in. So here we go. This is, this is my friend Estroff. <clears throat> Estroff of the forest people, Estroff of the forest people, Estroff of the forest people. Estroff Pinebark, the forest known, left his family and forsook his home. He joined some friends and started a quest to escort Lord Issa and his guests. It was almost noon and on our very first day. The elf guide Aslis did not have much to say. When all of a sudden his ears perked up, there was something in the woods and I asked, what's up? He said nothing but let an arrow fly. Seemed to be a miss, but not a bad try. Then before I knew it, there were cries of orcs. Our caravan being raided, Durian equipped, of course. Estroff, Estroff Pinebark, the savior of Seven Echo. Estroff, Estroff Pinebark, a hero wherever he goes. There was this noise and that. There was chaos all around. My little buddy Estroff could not be found. He had jumped from my shoulders and vanished in a fog. That guy runs faster than any hunting dog. When I finally came upon him, he had three orcs entangled. I helped him leave their corpses bloody and mangled. We headed to the caravan to check on the others. Who'd we find but our other three brothers? Durant, Acker, and Galmir were safe and sound. There weren't any other orcs around. We had all earned our pay that day, but Estroff was the hero, and that's why I say, Estroff, Estroff, Pinebark, the savior of Seven Echo. Estroff, Estroff, Pinebark, a hero wherever he goes. Let's jump ahead to a more recent time while I keep going off with this rhyme. To Dragon Falls, we were eventually sent. Conquest after conquest, wherever we went. There we met a villain, a real shim shady. 
He gets around real good for someone probably 80. We knew he was a bad guy, but we made a good plan to trick him into thinking he is our boss man. First, there was a conquest of a different sort. It happened just after we got to port. For one special night, Estroff had a lady, a real special girl, a captain named Katie. Everybody, Estroff, 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 you you have inspired yourself you gained inspiration from your recollections uh tuco you feel like you you understand much more now about these traveling adventurers and uh some of the paths that they've been on hey by uh, the way some of you guys probably noticed that i left out the entire chapter of our time in seven echo i'm not sure i want to sing about that deranged lunatic in public. Like, I mean, we never know who might be watching and listening into us, right? Yeah. Yeah. yeah, I didn't want to think about that guy. We'll tell you later, Tuco, when we try to prepare. The king of hearts. That's right. And as you can see, the ballad was kind of about all the rest of us too. It wasn't just Astroff. I don't want, I don't want his head to get too big. Oh, no, no, I am very modest. Like, I think most his, head's already, his head's already three S drops high, right? <laughs> three S drops. <laughs> well, thanks, guys. Um, so, yeah, I you noticed. Guys, um, go ahead. Riff, in, in your song, I, I was hoping to hear about who this Alyssa Hunadakis is. Oh, oh yeah. Let me tell you about Alyssa Hunadakis. She is an amazing author who loves to write about dragons. Many right. a cautionary tale. Someday, if you find yourself lucky, you will possess one of her works. Yes. Yeah, that's really I don't cool. really have the insight that, that uh, Durant has on, on her. So he's, he's your uh, guy. I want to know more. You guys um, find that the 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 smell associated with the trolls uh, is is not as overpowering within the magical confines of the hut, and also the the temperature and just the climate. Basically, it's not as like musty. It's just a very comfortable experience. Um, just after the song, Humphrey Humphrey like woke up for a second. And like chimed in, and then he put his head back down and went back to sleep. Um, what are all of you guys doing during the eight hours of uh, your time in the hut? I'll take a watch. Okay. Yeah, at some point I'll take a watch too, but I'm gonna mess around with the herbalism kit, maybe spike it with some of the new 25 year old wine. Yes. Yeah. So. Need to make a roll for that, right? Um, watch as well. Yeah, let's do the watches first. Um, okay. So I'm going to do. Let me just make my. Uh, who's on on first watch? Durant. Okay, Durant. Um, give me a perception check. That is a killer roll. Uh, that would be a dirty 20. Oh, all right. So dirty. forgot that you have, you have incredibly high perception. Um, during your time, you, you gaze out from the comfort of the hut at the darkness all around you, lacking dark vision yourself. Um, you don't see or hear anything that troubles you. And your watch is over. Um, who's on second watch? Me. Okay. While you're on second watch, you want to mess around a little bit of herbalism. What What are you trying to herbalistically craft? Uh, I'm going to go ahead and try to make another berry concoction uh, and just see if I could get the consistency right. So I know it was already healing, but 
it was kind of chunky last time. It's more like paste, good berry. Okay, I got you now. All right, so you're you're gonna mess around with a little bit of twig and a little bit of um, some of the other stuff you have. Yeah. So, um, yeah, go ahead and make your roll. Um, add your wisdom in there and and your proficiency bonus. As a nat one. <laughs> oh no. <laughs> it's poison. <laughs> I'm going to randomize what it is. It'll be oh, one. No. <laughs> um. Now you didn't say to begin with that. Um. That you were going to immediately taste test this. So I want you to roll a d6. And if your number that you roll is within two of the number that I roll, then we're going to say that you taste test your own potion. Go ahead. Five. You're a lucky man. <laughs> I rolled a one. So here's what happens. You, you craft this up and you smell it and you look at it and you're like, you just you, like you have this intuition where you're like, it would not be wise to try this out. So you have lost your ingredients. They are spoiled. And I keep that. You want to keep the spoiled potion? You could. I suppose you could, actually. Now that I think about it, why not? <laughs> um, so write this down. Okay. It is a swirling liquid that is wheat in color. And I know what effect it has, which I will make a note of in my notes. Um, okay, so you will then take your rest, which brings us to the perception check for you while you're on watch. Go ahead and do that. So that's a 19. Pretty dang good. Even with your dark vision, you don't see anything out there. It seems clear. Um, Tuco. So while he's uh, uh, on watch, he's going to be uh, practicing his forms, sword forms, and just... It's not that shape. big. It's like being I mean, in a tent. You, you don't oh. have a um, You could definitely, like, meditate, but you can't really um, bust out the, the swords. You don't really have that much uh, room. Um, make a perception check for me while you are on watch. 21. 21 is excellent for the immediate vicinity and nothing is really there. Okay. Um, everybody has had a long rest. Reap the benefits. You guys feel much better. Um, you have no sense of what time it is because you're in a cave, but um, Riff, you definitely sense that the magical energies fueling the hut are about to fade. So you kind of give everybody a heads up. And, you know, about an hour before um, Humphrey gets out his spell book and begins memorizing spells. Uh, and the rest of you kind of can do what you need to do. People Those all like you some breakfast or something for people. Yeah, you have rations. Uh, I'm assuming that you're not like making a fire or anything, but you're just eating kind of like dry rations. Um, very good. Okay, so this brings us to the conclusion of the long rest. The dreamer of the hut fades, and you guys find yourself once again in the stinky troll horde infested level. Um, there don't seem to be any new trolls but the, the pungent odor of trolls living here for a long time is still very present. Um, you mentioned that you wanted to do further searching. Who all is doing that and how? Because there are some of you who don't have dark vision, so I want to know what you're doing for a light source. So I'm going right back to the same spot where I found the, uh, the box and specifically looking for you know anything else that 
I think we remind me of, of Dak or. Um, okay. So you're, going going made. Made. You're, you're doing a more deep kind of search. Um, make um, investigation checks. I'm going to help him over there. Okay. So I'll let you guys make one investigation check with advantage because you have Tuco and Estroff helping you. So between torchlight and dark vision and multiple people kind of helping, you get that investigation check with advantage. If there's anything specific that Riff would be looking for, it'd be some kind of like evidence of, I don't know, something that his uh, father would have held on to as a memory of his of Riff's mother, because Riff never met his mother. So like we saw the, the, the image with the young boys on it. He'd hope to find something like, like his father would have kept for her. Um, with uh, that, that's 21. Have you ever shared the name of, have you ever told anybody the name of the mother? In other words, has, no. I, I don't think you have. Okay. I just wanted to make sure that no. you haven't like said that in the narrative so far. Um, uh, yeah. Yeah. I mean, right now, like I can tell the guys like, you know, it, it really always bothered me. My, my, uh, my dad told me that that my mom, who was an elf, obviously, uh, fell out of a tree to her death. And I'm, that never sat well with me. Like elves are like the most graceful, <laughs> you know, creatures. And, and she was a wood elf. She lived in the trees for a, was for life and she just like fell out of a tree um that's really all he told me i'm gonna insight check that uh that is an eight total you feel like he's telling you the truth Um, so what was the, uh, what was the, um, role for your investigate? 21. Okay. So as you kind of further delve through this stuff, you don't find anything that is resonating with you as being particularly related to um, your father or your mother, but you do find more of these kind of similar things where it looks like loot that was maybe taken from trade caravans or from adventurers. Um, there's a, like a lot of just piles of, of like equipment, mining equipment, uh, hiking and climbing gear. Um, just like personal, you know, things like armor, weapons. And a lot of it is like just old and covered in dust and cobwebs as if it's piled up over the years. And, and your I, overall sense is just that everything in this troll horde cave uh, must be stuff that was like brought in on a semi-regular basis. Hmm. Upon seeing the piles of stuff that Riff is sifting through, uh, Durant is going to check the stuff that's flying out of the pile, I assume, as Riff is tossing it aside, uh, to see if there are any books by Alyssa Hanaduthis or uh, if there are any other general personal journals or things of that effect. I'm going to uh, invoke my special bill system you have a 5% chance. Now, here's how this works. I'm going to roll a D20. You're going to roll a D20. If your number comes within, if your number is exactly on my number, that will result in something extremely awesome. But if it's within one, it will still be cool. Ready, set, go. Okay. I rolled a 10. Not close. Okay. As, as uh, one thing that you notice a sincere lack of actually are books. It seems like the majority of things here are tools uh, like, you know, crowbars, picks, hammers, shovels, 
um, pitons, you know, climbing gear, rope. There's like, you guys realize if you had some way to take all this mundane stuff out and like bring it to the village of Tavalar, that you would literally like double their economy, right? Like you could, you could like start your own general store with the amount of stuff up in this board, but it's all just kind of like old mundane crap. Some of it is like dry rotted, like some of the ropes gone bad. Um, there's some, some of the weapons that seem and tools that seem like older, uh, have like, you know, they're pitted from rust and stuff. Uh, but that's, you know, you do find a lot of personal effects, but they're not things that seem to be from your father. They, they seem to be like the same kind of things though. You know, like you find a, a locket, just, you know, a little brass locket with like a, you know, a silhouette drawing of like a woman. And then, you know, um, you, you find, you know, maybe uh, a chest that has a bunch of clothes and, and inside is a little like wooden framed charcoal drawing of, you know, a, a group of three children. But it, it looks like this is the kind of stuff that was looted from, from trade caravans and, and expeditions and that kind of stuff. Your father may not have been here. He may have lost this from thieves or other things, and then they got waylaid by the ones that we fought. Yeah, that's very possible. And, um, I definitely, I don't know if I have the ability to, to sense things like that, but if there was a way where I would somehow feel it, you know, that my father had passed, I haven't had any kind of sensation like that. Is there a the sound of it. feels that his weird birthmark again. From the sound of it, your father got around a bit. Yeah, yeah, he he poured himself into his, his work and uh, he would be gone off for long periods of time, I mean, months at a time. And, uh, you know, he was, we were more like, like amicable roommates really than father and son. We just never really got close. With your knowledge of wood making, can you tell anything else about the box? And um, the knowledge of your father's you could tell that it was and... made it was made with like fine tools. It wasn't like a rough hewn box. Like it was definitely something that would have required like fine tools. Um, you know, some of the some of the like positioning of of the screws that keep everything in place are, you know. Of, of a of a high craftsman level of precision the the hinges are like perfectly level um the you know and even even the finish on the box despite the fact that it's covered in in you know dust um the finish on the box like was was very well done i flip open the, the box one more time to see if it plays that tune that estroff and i uh, recognize it does. So if we can remember like where we where we know that from. We need to do like a history check or something. No. Nope. It's just familiar at this point. It's familiar. All right. It's the Bella the Mistrust. That's right. My mom, my mom, my dad, I guess, put me to sleep singing that to me when I was a baby. We know that's um, not true either because he was You, um, you guys spend, I'll say an hour investigating all of this different stuff. Um, and in the course of the investigations, you find a very, very, um, like just, just a lot of, of, um, troll debris, you know what I mean? Like, like as if the trolls lived here for a long time as well. Um, skins, bones, you know, they, they kind of had these primitive, like shanty tent, you know, areas and, and, um, and it, it seems like they discarded all the stuff that you went through on one side of the cavern and then kind of lived on the other side of the cavern with the, the stone stairs kind of in the middle. Um, speaking of which, at no point in this time have you heard anything from down below from the stone giant in the foyer 
or from the level above you. Like you see the stairs plain as day with your lights and your dark vision, but you have not heard anything. Sir Maelstrom, should we try continuing? Do you have, uh, has your necklace revived itself to give us the power to fly again? But we may be quiet and make good progress at the same time. Yeah, yeah, I'm, I'm very much on board with doing that. Um, just while you're taking up enough of your guys' time down here, I thank you for letting me do a little bit more looking around. Um, Riff looks very distracted, like there's a lot of different emotions going through him all of a sudden. Uh, yeah, let's go. And I'll just be ready, you know, I'll, I'll be ready to use the necklace as needed. Like, I don't know if we should do it before we see what's up on the next floor. But, uh, I'm in search of well. So how do you want to do this? Well, pass Riff my wine, say, take a swig, it is quite good. Then after he takes a swig, I'll take it back and I'll start walking up are struggling up because they're almost as tall as I am. <laughs> okay. So you guys start to go up the stone stairs. Uh, are, are we doing stealth or just moving? Uh, I think this floor is fairly secure. So probably when we get sort of within 30 feet of the next floor is okay. probably where we would start stealthing. Um, Durant at this point would probably like to take the lead uh, mainly because he's a meat puppet. Um, and his light source again is what? Whoever's behind him with a torch. Okay. I have a lantern. Tuco has a lantern. Go, yep. I'll go behind him. Okay. Um, and Astroff, I mean, there's plenty of room. Like you guys could all, all go up together if you wanted. I mean, it's giant size. So, um, you guys, you know, can, can do that. You're, you're heading up. Humphrey is in the back, um, and he's, you know, he's kind of cautious, but also kind of staying close to uh, Riff and to Estrop. As you guys get up to about the last 30 feet before you arrive at the next level up, go ahead and make me uh, stealth checks. Okay. Nat 20. I am invisible. 20. Uh, stealth, stealth, stealth. 20, 30. Wow. That is the best stealth check that Durant has ever done. Yes, it is. <laughs> um, you guys <laughs> stealth up. Well to, done. You, you get up to this level and you kind of, you know, cautiously kind of go up. You, you know, you're, you're, the two humans are certainly relying on Tuco's lantern, uh, kind of not, not just swinging it around, but kind of carefully bringing it up to the level. And, and what you see is a, much more naturalistic cave looking system. Okay. Gone is the level of stone giant craftsmanship and architecture and engineering. This looks like almost like if an elevator stopped at a level that it wasn't supposed to stop to. That's what this looks like. There are stalactites and stalagmites everywhere. It is there's cobwebs all over and like literally the only thing that that looks like it's man-made in this area is the stairs that you are on, which seem to go up another, you know, 90 feet to a level above this. But the level that you're currently on from what you can see with the lantern light just looks like like a cave system that has you know, it's uninhabited and, and it's just, there's cobwebs everywhere. There's, you even occasionally hear like dripping, like moisture, dampness. Um, and you we hear any heights, stalagmites everywhere. Um, those of you with dark vision can see a little further out. And this level looks as if it is just as wide as the previous level. Like it's, it is a massive, you know, hundred feet radius. So you can't even see the edges of the walls at this point where you are in the center. We know what we piercers need. look like now. Do we notice anything? Uh, piercers. Um, go ahead, make it make perception checks. That is 22. You expertly with your dark vision, you scan 
as far around you as you can. Now you can't, because you only have 60 foot dark vision and the, the ceiling on this is like 90. So you can't see all the way to the center closest to where the, the stair, the stone stairs go up to, but kind of going up by the edges, as far as you could see, you don't see any stalactites that look like anything other than stalactites. I think we should keep going. Do we fly yet? Are you asking Humphrey? Because he's like, um, I don't know. I was more asking group consensus. Oh. Oh. I am fine with walking. Yeah, let's keep walking. Uh, uh, how about somebody that can see a little further than I can take the lead for a bit? Oh, sorry, who else has dark vision? Because I just realized. Yeah. Oh, uh, make a perception check. The people with dark vision or Durant? Just the people with dark vision. Because the people okay. that are in the lantern would not hear this or uh, see this. What's that? 17. Oh. Okay, so. Five. <laughs> um, well, so, so Astrof, you're, I'm, I'm assuming that you're kind of focused on looking above for potential um, depth. Yeah. Um, Riff, as, as he's looking kind of up, you're looking kind of out at the field of stalagmites and you know what's what's around on the ground level and and you see just like maybe 50 feet away from the stone stairs you see what look like a few bags like large burlap sacks and backpacks and stuff kind of piled you see like silver and gold kind of like piled um these, these look like they were like dumped there um, in the same, kind of the same fashion as the troll horde. They're not like stacked up nicely. It looks like they were thrown into this pile. Um, and you see like one distinct pile that's like that. And then in, in another direction, kind of north of your, your stone stairs in the center, you see another pile of stuff that looks like crates, but as if they were literally thrown because they're smashed. Like the wood is smashed. Um, and you okay. can't really see what is mm -hmm. in them, but you see that like, as if these crates, which are not small, they're like four by four foot wooden crates were just thrown and they're smashed. Okay, Riff uh, gets out his short bow and he fires at the pile that has like coins coming out of it. It looks like coins. He just shoots an, an arrow into it. Make an attack roll. When Tupo sees him launch an arrow, he gets his swords ready. Okay. Durant is taking defensive posture. I don't think I've noticed yet. I rolled a five. <laughs> It was bad. It wasn't eight. Now, but I'm getting ready. So I, I got an eight trying to shoot a giant bag of whatever. Um, the arrow flies by. It, it, it kind of like ricochets off of a couple of the stalagmites that are at ground level and just the arrow like flies off into the darkness. What's wrong? Did you see something? Right. Well, I see like several bags that maybe... Looks like there's some coins coming out of them. I see some smashed crates. And, you know, it could be, it, it almost looks like what we saw down below, the way some of the stuff was arranged. Um, but I don't know. I just had a feeling that maybe it wasn't what it seems to be. And so I was taking a shot at it. But as you can see, that didn't go very well. Um, I know so you are. I put it to you guys. I want to roll insight now that he's kind of, pointed my attention that way oh you you see it you see like once he points it out because you have dark vision you could see about 50 feet away you know uh, amidst all these stalagmites and stuff you see these piles of sacks and a couple maybe backpacks uh and you see coins kind of spilled out at you know 
different intervals around this pile as if it was all just tossed uh, over there over time. And I don't see anything off about it. Nothing that's, you know, placed there intentionally. It looks like or... no one's, it looks like, it looks like nothing's contributed to this pile in a while because you see cobwebs kind of like between the stalagmites. So unlike the troll, um, like the, 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 the loot that you guys found in the, the troll horde seems to be like, you know, regularly more new stuff was thrown onto it. Right. Um, but this, this looks like a bunch of stuff was taken and thrown or discarded into a pile and nobody's been through here because there's a lot of cobwebs. I'll start there's walking over. Want to find more information about your father, but at the best, you just have more things to carry up. Why don't we continue on up and then we can make a more thorough investigation on the way back down. As you're saying this, Chuko, Astroff just starts walking over. <laughs> uh, Dorad is going to cast command. <laughs> okay. Stop at Esteroff. Uh, That's a DC 14. DC 14 spell save or uh, wisdom. Wisdom save. I get advantage on wisdom saves. Woo, doggy. Let's see. So that would be. Do you. Let's see. Wisdom save would be. Well, that's already a dirty 20. Yeah, yeah. we'll go with dirty 20. <laughs> All right, then. And I go, yeah. And I keep going. <laughs> okay. So, what, uh, Riff, what do you do? You see Estorop start walking over towards the, the gold and silver. Wait, let's just give him a quick search, guys. Let's just go over. Um, okay. We don't have to spend as much time here. Just anything obvious. And when we get within range, uh, I want to use Riff, wants to use Mage Hand. And like grab a handful of the coins. Uh, as soon as Durant can see it, he's going to sacred flame it. The coins? Whatever it is, just just to test Rift's theory. Okay. So Estroff, you see your friends begin to to go. Are you going with them with the light? I'm I'm drawing my swords. I'm not looking at anything, but I'm looking for enemies or danger. Correction. You're drawing a sword, lantern, sword. Ah, yes. Okay. My he, he drew or, a sharp lantern, or you set your, or you're setting your lantern down, aiming nope. in that general. Okay, I just nope. want to make sure because this is pitch dark, right? Um, you guys start going over there, and I'll say, you know, you you, you get within. You said range. What's your range on Mage Hand? Thirty. Thirty feet. Yeah. yeah 30 so feet. When you get within thirty feet, um, you you pick up the coins. You start picking up coins. You grab a handful of silver and, and gold. Uh, Astroff, you see the power of Mage Hand floating coins towards you. And then, Astroff, uh, you see them float past you uh, to your front roof. I kind of poke around with my staff. You, then... you come up there and you get a closer look. You, you, can, you can see now that it looks similar to the kind of stuff that was in the area below, but maybe deposited a while ago. So you, you kind of take your staff and you wipe away some of the cobwebs and you see that there are uh, about three or four satchels full of, of coins. Um, a lot of copper, some silver, some gold. Um, and you, you also see bags that look like it have uh, ball bearings, like there's little iron ball bearings. Um, and you, you also see, uh, another large sack that looks like it has, um, metal, uh, pitons for like climbing. Is there any symbols or anything on the bag? Nope. I want to take one of the ball bearings and throw it at the crate just in case. Okay. Make a, make a roll. You can throw it at the crate. Does that add dexterity or? Yeah, sure. That'd be eh, 10. That's good enough. You hit the crate, nothing happens. I walk that way. Uh, as you begin to walk away, everyone roll initiative. <laughs> <laughs> Nat 20. Oh, man. 21. 
Boy, it's my day, 19. 30, 20. It is your day. <laughs> um, it's all of your days because all of you win. Uh, one mm -hmm. of the stalagmites sprouts tendrils and begins whipping around to attack all of you guys. But because of your cleverness, you, you see that this is happening and you're able to react. Um, Tuco, you're up first. So you're about 20 feet away, let's say, uh, you and Durant. And you see this stalagmite seem to come to life. And where it's like part of its rocky face was, the rocks open up into a giant mouth. And there's tendrils that kind of come out from it that, that it's, it's almost like you were staring at this stalagmite and then it just suddenly became this living thing. And it's just right in front of us? Yes, it is literally right next to the bags of, of gold and silver. Um, and uh, the, minute, the minute Esroth, like turned to start walking away towards the crates is when it sprung its tendrils up. We're being attacked. And I'm going to set my lantern down and draw my other sword. And then I'll hold my action to see if it comes towards us. Because it was like you said, it was 20 feet away. Yeah. OK. Um, let's go then with Riff. Riff and Esra, you guys tied. So um, tell me what you want to do. Yeah, Riff already had his uh, short bow in his hand spell, so he's going to just aim and fire. <laughs> Natural one. You're like, oh, and you're just so caught off guard <laughs> that you fire the arrow off like, and it kind of just flies off a skew of your, your target. Um, Estroff, right behind you are a whole bunch of tendrils trying to grab you. I am going to turn around, cast Flame Blade, and attack. Flame Blade is the bonus action, and you attack. Go ahead. You're going to attack uh, one of the, the tendrils? Yes. Okay. Let's see. That would be... 17. That's a hit. Roll damage. Nice. Let's see. Get that big fire damage. Get it. No, it's 1d10, but I think it's 2d10. Double Flame checking blade? real quick. Yeah. Oh, no. Sorry. It's d8, right? Flame Flame blade is d8, but isn't it 3d6 fire? I'm going to hit the target. Oh, yeah. 3d6 fire. One. <laughs> One. Two. Four. You roll. You rolled four total damage. I rolled a one, a one, and a two. Oh my God, um, that is not enough to kill the tendril. It's enough to wound the tendril. Uh, did you already record your weapon damage? Did you add that in? No. Where would you add the weapon damage? Um. Yeah, I don't, I don't know that you add the weapon damage in, Eric, do you? Oh, I was always... Says, it says you, did. You, you can use your attack, your action to make a melee spell attack with the fiery blade. Oh, okay. All right. On a hit, the target takes 3d6. So, I mean, it lasts 10 minutes, but it's, it's 3d6. It does a lot of damage, usually, unless you roll a one way two. <laughs> right. If you upcast it, it can do 4d6 uh, or, you know, four. Um, so, tendril one takes... Four damage. Okay. Weak. Um, this brings us to Durant somehow miraculously beating out the monsters in initiative. Okay, so as my bonus action, I'd like to cast Shield of Faith. Uh, who between Esteroff and Riff would have the lower AC? Oh, I don't know. I've got a 13. That'd be Estroff. Okay, I'm going to I'm gonna as my bonus action, cast Shield of Faith on, on Estroff. Now Estroff starts glowing. Okay. we got uh, fire and glowing skin. <laughs> and what does that grant him again? Uh, plus two on AC. Okay. Nice. Uh, and then as my action, uh, I'm going to, for the first time ever, cast Guiding Bolt. Ooh, Guiding Bolts. What do I have to do with that? I have to look because I don't remember off the top of my head. Give me two seconds. 
Uh, range spell attack on a hit target takes 46 radiant damage. Jesus. Next attack made against the, the target before the end of my turn has advantage. Are you doing it first or second? Yo, Humphrey's uh, about to get it. It's, Sorry, it's first. Ahead. It's first. Uh, actually, uh, I'm going to upcast this all the way to third level. Oh, good. So <laughs> that's going to do 2d6 additional damage. So it's going to be 6d6, so six, and I'm targeting... Radiant. Right, correct. There's, no, there's no save, right? It's You're a ranged spell, spell attack. attack. So okay. uh, that's a plus six. Give me a second. Uh, and you're doing this, this on the main body, right? Correct, yeah. Okay. This is a 16. Yeah, that's a hit. All right, let's roll some damage. Hold that. Wreck it. He uh, rolled a one, a one, a one, a one, a one. <laughs> it was a six, a two, and a two for 10 for, for the first three. And also a six, a two, and a two for 10 on the second three. So that's 20 damage. 20 damage. Radiant, and now it's also glowing in addition to Estroth. Think Disco Ball, <laughs> and the wizard goes next. All right, and before the wizard, I, uh, I want to take my action. My health. yeah, do, do you want to attack? Uh, do you want to attack Dave with like attack one of the tendrils that are coming at you guys because one of them's coming for you? So, um is that tendril glowing or is that part the glowing part part of the uh, I'm gonna say that that Durant's spell affects the in the body and tendrils. Okay, so, so you, since you can get uh I mean you you can attack and and what is the benefit of that, Eric? Uh it's advantage on the next attack. So the advantage will allow me to use my sneak attack. Yeah. All right. So my I'll go attack my my main attack. Yep. Thirteen plus eight, uh, twenty-one. That's a hit. So roll your scimitar plus your sneak attack damage. Five, six, seven, eight, nine, ten, eight. eighteen damage. You cut you you completely sever um, yes. the tendril that was coming towards you. You like cut it off, uh, Boromir style. Um, the is there another one close by me that I could use my bonus action on um, offhand blade. Yes, you could attack the one that's heading towards Rift. All right, I'll do that. No sneak attack damage, obviously, but I do have advantage, though, right? Yeah. Twenty-three. That's a hit. Damage. Six. Okay, not dead, but certainly helpful. Um, Humphrey just <laughs> firebolt, firebolt, firebolt. <laughs> That is a hit for 19 damage. Gosh. <laughs> That's going to go uh, straight to the main body, the corpus. The main corpus takes 19 damage. Uh, and now it is its turn. So of the surviving tendrils, one will attempt to attack Riff and miss. The next one will attempt to attack Estroth and miss. Wow. Then we have the Durant tendril and miss. The Humphrey tendril. Miss. It just woke up. I mean, it we can't judge very, it that harshly. It moves very slowly towards you guys. It moves 10 feet closer to you guys. Top of the order. Tuco, you're up. So it's... There's no tendrils near me, and the main body is ten feet. No, away. there's still there's still one, there's still one tendril um, that's adjacent to you, trying to attack Rift. 
the main okay. body itself okay. is only 10 feet away. So if you wanted to move in and attack the main body, you could. Uh, uh, I'm going to go get to... advantage. You won't get a flanking bonus. Yep. I'll, I'll go attack the, the tendril that's going for rift. Okay. Plus eight, 19. That's a hit. Nine damage. Now that one dies. Okay. And then, is there any others near me? Or no. is the main body closest? Just the main body. Okay. So then I'm going to move up to the main body and attack that with my offhand. Okay. Go ahead. Twenty-three. That's a definitely a hit. Six damage. Six more to the mean body. Okay, this brings us to um, Rift. All right, Rift um, throws his bow and gets his rapier out and runs up as he uh, hums uh, a little thing from Estroff. Uh, bow of Estra Pinebark to himself and his head to give him courage and runs up to stab the, the thing. And he gets a 23 to hit. That's a hit. Just um, six piercing damage with the great beer. Okay. Done deal. Um, this brings us now to Estra. All right. Still advantage, right? Yep. All oh, right. I should have rolled. So that would be a 22. Uh, hold on one second. My... So it says the next attack roll, like singular. Yeah, that's... I, I initially I interpreted it as that like everybody after you until your next round gets that. I, I'm no, going to say just... that it's just one, which we already doled out. So uh, if you if you want to make an attack, Astrop at um like on the main body or on the yeah. on the tendril. If you want to make uh, an well, the main body, you're ten feet away from it, so you can attack it. Yeah, I'll go ahead and do that. What are you using? The flame blade, and then that would be a 23. That's a hit. Give me that damage. Oh, nice. There we go. That's nine, but I mean, it's way better than four. Yep. All right. Um, Durant. Uh, so first off, I'd like to correct a mistake that I made last turn, uh, and that's that I could not have cast both spells in the same turn. Oh, so uh, I will say that I'm casting Shield of Faith in this turn. Okay. Uh, instead of last turn, I hope that didn't um, screw anything it didn't, up. It didn't have an impact on him because I rolled so poorly that you wouldn't. It wouldn't have mattered. Okay. Well, now Shield of Faith is up, and uh, okay. I guess I'm gonna take a swing with the short sword at the tentacle that's heading for me. Okay. Uh, that's a 13 to hit. Miss. You, I'm not even going to say you miss. You hit this thing, but it's like hitting rock. It kind of like bounces off, sort of. Um, this brings us to Humphrey. Humphrey shoots a fire bolt. Fire bolt, singular. This time not doing an incredible amount of damage, but still, whatever. Um, all right. It is time for the thing. Tendril number three is a... Uh, 17 to hit Estra. That hits. Um, what is... Uh, make a strength, um, strength saving throw. Oh, no. 
That's a 10. You are grappled. Fantastic. Um, tendril number four against Durant will be... Oh, 24 to hit. That hits. Make a strength saving throw. Okay. Oh, this will be fun. Uh, I rolled a natural 19 for 18 saving throw. Damn you. <laughs> All right. You can't do anything. Um, well, you'll be basically, you, you're going to break free. Um, oh, no, that works. Okay. And then uh, who is standing nearest to the body? So we have Riff. Tuco and Astroth. Uh, one, two is Rift, three, four is Tuco, five, six is Astroth. Astroth. Ooh. Astroth, the thing bites you and you take 17 hit points of damage. Oh, no. It, it basically reels you in and goes like, oh, and you're like, ah. And you guys see this like horrific rock stalagmite mouth open up and just chomp uh, as it's as it's you know hold him in. Um, top of the order to go. Okay, so S drop is within five feet of me, right? Yes. All right, so I'm gonna attack the main body. Sweet. Twenty one. That's a hit. And you get sneak attack damage because you're uh, flanked with with Riff. Fifteen points of damage. Okay. And then I'm going to uh, attack my short sword offhand, and that's a fourteen. Fourteen's a miss. Um, okay, this brings us to Riff. You see Estrof being just chomped on. What would you like to do, sir? Riff would like to whisper a discordant melody at the creature with the oh. whispers. Oh no, what's the saving throw against that? Probably something that it's bad at. Wisdom. <laughs> oh, wait. Wisdom. wait. I got you. Wisdom save. Here it goes. The roll. A six plus three is nine. No, that's a fail. What happens? <laughs> Takes 3d6 psychic damage. Oh. This will be only six. Man, let's put the six ciders today. And, um, Immediately use its reaction to move as far as its speed allows away from me. That is awesome because, okay. Um, so it moves. It's hopefully, open. hopefully dropping its grappling hooks on well, everyone. So, I, I so it's Astroff's turn. Astroff, make a another strength save. Yeah, it's an eight. Can I also cast Thunder Wave? Uh, no. No? I don't know if you can, actually. My guess is, is that you are bound by a tendril, and I'm not sure if you have the ability to use the somatic components. Well, let me look that up right quick. Thunder wave. Verbal and somatic. Hmm? Nope. Did it move away? Do I get a Back of opportunity. Um, yes. All right. Let's see if I can knock them down. Durant, you're up. Sixteen plus eight, twenty-four. Yep. Six, Eleven damage. Okay. Durant, you are up. Okay, I'm going to bluster off. And uh, also bless Tuco and Riff. 
Okay. What does that do? Uh, so bless reading from the handy dandy manual here. Um, you bless up to three creatures of your choice within range. Whenever a target makes an attack roll or a saving throw before the spell ends, the target can roll a D4 and add the number of roll, the number rolled to the attack or saving throw. Uh, I'm also going to drop the, um, the shield of faith at this point. Uh, and then I'm just going to take a swipe with my short sword at uh, what's whatever's near me. Is it a tendril or do I actually have a shot at the main body? And what direction is the it? The main moving? body moved a whopping 10 feet away because that's its movement. But am I closer to it? Uh, no, you're closer to the tendril because there's still tendrils whipping around behind it as it's getting away from Rift that are closer to you and uh, so it's Humphrey. So it's not approaching Humphrey and myself then. It's... No. Okay. Uh, well, I can't cast another spell, so uh, I'm going to pull out... Eh, no, I'm not. Hang on. Bless was not a bonus action. No, it was an action. So uh, never mind then. I guess that's the end of my turn. Okay. Humphrey is going to take a pot shot at it as it's lean, trying desperately not to hit his friend Estroff, but he's shooting at the tendril that is holding Estroff and hits it with firebolt. What could go wrong? <laughs> Damage. Um, and you fall to the ground. The tendril is scored and it drops. Um, and this brings us to the last tendril that it has. It's not going to bite anyone because no one is close to it anymore. But it will whip its last tendril. That's a 19. So uh, 1, 2, 2, go, 3, 4, Riff, 5, 6, Astroph, 7, 8, Durant, 9, 10, Humphrey. It will go after Durant. AC 21. Oh, it nice. snaps a tendril up against you. Um, I can do it too. <laughs> and that brings us to Tuco. All right, go to the main body again. Okay. So 13 plus four, 17. Yeah. Um, Six, nine, 11 damage. Okay. For my offhand attack, does the uh, bless still count? Mm, I don't know. Oh, it's a natural one anyway, so never mind. Okay, that brings us to Riff. Um, it is trying to move away from you with its whopping speed of 10. Um, all right, so that's that's not an ongoing, like how, how long does that last? The, like the, the duration of the... As long as I concentrate, well, 10 minutes as long as I'm concentrating on it. Oh, dissonant whispers? Or... If, I wanted to do, oh. if I wanted to do the same thing, do I have to cast the same the same spell or is it still like under the first casting of the spell i wasn't sure about that after reading things uh, like is it a concentration spell information uh, no it looks like it's a one-time jam okay duration is right, i'm just going to oh. i'm just going to make fun of it and uh, use vicious mockery on it Say what a terrible um, stalagmite it is. Like, this is <laughs> home territory and it's running away when I just like whistle it, at it. It fails its uh, save. <laughs> um, all right. A whopping 1d4 psychic damage. Okay. Four. Nice. Um, and then have disadvantage on its next attack roll if that happens. 
Okay. That's all. Uh, Astroff, you are free of a of a tendril. Am I prone or am I ready? You are prone. So you can get up, but you're right next to it. I mean, it doesn't move fast. So, so I'm going to get up and then cast Thunder Wave because I'm a little pissed off at it. That's a spell save of 14. That's con save. Ooh, now con. That's its jam. But I don't think that makes... Uh, that's a total of 11. Nope. Okay. And I'm casting it at third level. So that is 4d8. All right. So that's 16. And then I'm, as a bonus action, I'm bringing back up Flame Blade for next round. 16. And he's pushed back 10 more feet. Yeah, you're like, Hadoken! And it just, whoosh, like the thing flies, it like kind of tips back. Um, Durant, you're up. Uh, is it clearly running at this point? Or is it Well, it can't around? run. It kind of amorphously blobs away. Uh, and it just got pushed 10 feet further. So it is now 10 feet past the original treasure pile ambush point that it was at. Meaning 20 feet away from you. Well, you know what? Uh, this thing is still very much a threat. So uh, I'm going to go ahead and cast. Um, yeah, I'm going to cast Sacred Flame. Uh, which is a deck save. Yeah. No, that's that is not going to be a success. That was a split of a seven. Big number. Uh, that is fourteen damage. Okay. It's uh, it's kind of wobbly. It looks like it's you know, efforts to move are, are, are kind of more as a matter of survival now. Um, Humphrey's going to uh, shoot it again with a firebolt. Mm, that's an 18. For 13 damage and puts it out of its misery. Firebolt goes streaking past you guys, hits this thing. The thing kind of stumbles and collapses. And it sounds like a bag of wet cement hitting the ground. It's just, it just kind of has like a sloshing, rocky noise. And it kind of like deflates a bit and makes a gaseous expulsion. Like, <laughs> um, and it is, like I said, it's, you know, past the original sacks of coins and there's I'm gonna a... follow it and stab it again because I'm kind of pissed off <laughs> yeah you you hack it up it has this really uh kind of disgusting kind of thick hide that's like rock but now as you get closer you could see that there was kind of a camouflage uh mechanism like a chameleon um it's it's just this weird kind of aberration um, that looks like a stalagmite. And by the way, there are a couple, you know, dozen of, of these similar looking stalagmites all around the vicinity of where you guys are. None of them are moving. Just, no. guys. <laughs> this money is just going to weigh us down. And well, we can get it out of that. Let's just see what's in the crates and everything. Not just looking for money here, but maybe more clues. Like you guys want to go over by the crate? Durant doesn't. <laughs> Luko's gonna leave his swords out, but he's not getting too close. Okay. Uh so is anybody grabbing any of the, the, the coin sacks or no? No. No, I think. But Tuco said, like, we can maybe hit it up on the way okay. back if, if uh, we do come back. So who is going over by the crates? 
can I go first? I'll because like I said, I was heading that way, but now I hacked him up. I'm gonna walk over there and then just cast Thunder Wave and break something. <laughs> yeah. Just like right next to the freaking crates. All right. Duco's uh-huh. gonna be within 30 feet of whoever's closest to it. Okay. So you're gonna cast Thunder Wave on the crates. Yeah. Just roll damage. Okay. I'm just gonna do it at second level, so or first level. So that's uh oh 16. So when you do this, you shatter, I mean you, you destroy all this wood, but What's odd is that it looks like these crates were empty. You don't see any other debris. You know, you splinter this wood and send it flying, but you don't see anything that looked like they were in there. Um, I'm going to walk when past you, everyone. When, when you do that, um, the rest of you guys make perception checks at disadvantage. Nine. Seventeen. That one. Seventeen. Really? It's a little bit natural. After the second epic thunder wave reverberates throughout this cavern, um, Durant, uh, from above you, kind of like from above, you're like not sure if it's from the level above you guys, you know, up the stone stairs, but you hear like some movement. Uh, incoming from above. This is the only the second level, guys. <laughs> I hope your spells come back real quick. Um, you guys look up. Anybody with? No, actually, not even dark vision. Okay, so you hear sounds at this point. It sounds like there's about, it sounds like there's about three sounds that are above you, but as you're trying to like shine your lantern and those of you with dark vision, you can't even really see the ceiling. Um, Does the sound sound like it's coming towards us? Yes, it's it's and it's kind of reverberating. It sounds kind of like a clicking, skittering sound. Ooh, okay. Um, are, you, are you guys ready to fly? <laughs> I think now is the time. <laughs> yeah, let's go. Yeah, Riff, Riff gets the, the necklace out and um, cast on everybody. Cast fly on everybody. Should be two charges to take care of everyone. Okay. You cast the first charge. Who are you doing the first charging? I, I will get uh, Tuco, Durant, and Estroff first. Okay. You do that. Uh, do the second charge. Okay. Doing it. I'll do it on um, Humphrey and myself. Um, Riff, what's your armor class? And Estroff, what's your armor class? 13. 15. Okay. So here's what happens right before you, I mean, you, you get everybody the flying and you're like ready to jump off and start flying. Riff, you get hit by this sticky web stuff that just kind of grabs at you. Um, and, and you're, you're like in it. Same thing with Estra. The rest of you guys see this, these like, these like webs, these bolts of webbing kind of come out from two different directions, sort of above and off center from you. And you see one of them kind of snare up Estroff, the other one snares up Riff. Now you're going to fly away, right? You're going to try to fly. So those of you who aren't caught in a web, where are you flying? Are you flying basically up the stone stairs? Do we see the the webbing coming out? You don't. And neither I, does I would either. Yeah. Do I see my friends? Yo, yeah, uh, you guys see your friends right next to you, like literally right after Riff uses the necklace and, and like 
Humphrey and every, you know, you all are ready to fly. It's like, you're about to jump up. That's why I said, where are you guys flying? Because they have to make when, the holes, but you have, you have to tell me where you're flying. When Tuco sees someone get webbed, he's going to go to that person and try and cut the webbing off of them. Okay. Yeah. It's sort of the same thing that Durant would be doing as well. I guess Durant okay. will go to the, you're going to attack, you're going to attack the webbing. Okay. That's fine. That's a doable thing. So, um, Tuco, you can make an attack roll. Natural 20. Okay. So who, who are you freeing? Um, Riff. Okay. Riff, you are free. Um, so Tuco, that was your attack. Where are you flying to now? Or are you, are you staying on the ground to help out? I think I'm staying on the ground okay. trying to take a defensive position next to Riff. All right, Riff, it's your turn. You've just been freed. Uh, thank you, Tuco. That was terrific. And I grabbed my, uh, my uh, dagger or my short sword, sorry, and I'm trying to free Estroff. Okay. Me. You want to make an attack roll? Go ahead. Mm -hmm. Is it just the, is it the regular weapon attack bonus? Yep. Okay, so 11. Okay. It's a hit. Damage. Six. That's enough. You cut the web. I'm like, let's go. Okay. And I suggest we like fly right back the direction that we came. Um, and then up. up. Yeah. So are you guys going up? That's what I need to know. You're going, you're basically flying up the stone stairs. Everyone's free of the webbing. Yes. Okay. You guys fly back to the stone stairs and then kind of fly up the stone stairs at obviously a much faster rate than you would be walking, sneaking, or running. You hear the skittering, but it is your, your, your movement seems to exceed the sounds that you're hearing, okay? You fly up the stone stairs and you come out on another level. The level that you come out on once again has the appearance of the stone giants, amazing stone uh, crafting. The, the, the architecture is, is reminiscent of the foyer that you saw uh, these, these immense pillars and supports um, are all in place. These archways and these decorative uh, kind of features are all, all exhibit that similar style in the, the Stone Giants engineering um, and their, the appearance. Um, in the center of the room, you see what looks like a large fountain um, when you, when you come out of the stone stairs, it looks like there's like a large fountain about 10 feet away from the stone stairs. Um, and it, the, the water is very still. It's not like actively pumped. It's just very still and murky and kind of stagnant looking. The rest of the chamber seems to be empty. Well, it seems like waste of fly to stop flying now. And we've got bad guys that could be coming up the stairs. Oh, yeah, you hear us. the skittering coming. I say we keep moving. Okay. Yep. All right. You guys fly up past this level. You go up to the next level. Again, slightly smaller. So instead of like a 100-foot radius, it's like an 80-foot radius. Um, but similar stone giant um, craftsmanship, engineering, and architecture is present throughout this level. Um, across from the stone stairs, there's what looks like a very faded but very wide um, runner, like a, a very long um, carpet, basically. And it's, it's faded and kind of dusty as if it hasn't been taken care of very well. And that carpet leads to an arched doorway. Again, this is like 15 feet tall. 
um, stone decorative uh, scroll work in the stonework, and then doors that are also closed. Um, other than that, on this level, you don't see anything. So I know we, we need to have... keep, but we still also kind of have to figure out how we're going to wake the sleeping king. And this looks royal, a carpet and a big doors, right? Is there stuff on there? Or can we not see the doors yet? You guys could fly over there if you want. I say we may want to check this out to see if we can find anything related to the king or the giants that were around before. Well, and if we can get behind the doors. Yeah, let's just kind of real quick. Does a perception check just to, to listen for um, the skittering again now that we've gone up another level? Yeah, totally. Well, I mean, Tuco, you're the spy. I trust your judgment. 15. Um, 15. You see, you see, like this, this room obviously looks, like I said, it has the same kind of um, craftsmanship that you've seen in the other layers that were, were built by stone giants. Um, but it oh, looks sorry that was that was supposed to be a perception check to see if to listen for this by uh the skittering oh, sound again. No 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 the spiders are way yeah. it, you don't hear them in pursuit of you. Okay. Sorry. Okay. And you don't and, yeah, you yeah, yeah, in that case I'm here to go. Cool. You don't hear anything above either. Yeah, I'm with Tuco. Um, like oh. let's check this out. Like it, it, Yeah, I want to go fly over to the door and, and examine the door and then check for traps. Uh, I'll make an Arcana check against the door. Okay. Uh, that's a fifteen. Um, what languages is Durant fluent in? Uh, common, Elvish, Dwarvish, Gnomish, Halfling, Celestial. Um, also, somewhat learning Orc-ish. Anybody fluent in Giant, perhaps? Okay. So when you approach the door, you see over over the archway, amidst all the scroll work, are runes. These are giant runes. Um, you, you're able to basically get the gist of these runes, but it's essentially like ancient, okay? So it's not like any kind of modern giant that you've studied. These are kind of ancient runes. Um, and it and, uh, and essentially it says um, what you translate as like sleeping chamber. Oh, like, and you're not sure if that means like, like bedroom, but it's it's like sleeping chamber. I tell everyone what I translated for them. This sounds like something we need to check out. Um, there do not seem to be any uh you can you can make your search for traps actually go ahead that investigation yeah i'm not very good at that 10 okay um you don't you don't seem to think there's any traps um the, door door have, the doors have huge like uh iron rings as handles but there's no like keyhole in, or anything so it looks like they, they can be pulled open. Um, you would have to reach them, but conveniently for you, you're all still flying, so. So I'm gonna try and open the door quietly if possible. Okay, you grab one of the rings and you hold it and you will yourself to fly back and you slowly begin pulling open the door. Uh, you know Just what, Durant will help. Okay. Well, because you guys are flying, it's actually relatively easy because you could just fly up to the nine foot tall uh, iron door rings and then pull them. So you, you open up these massive doors, um, not even all the way, but just, you know, enough. And what you see beyond is what looks like a bedroom, except a giant size bedroom. Um, all, all of the furniture though is built in to the structure to the architecture so there there's built-in stone shelves 
there are built there's a built-in kind of slab with like old furs that look like they're they're kind of modeled and they've been there for a long time um but perhaps at one time this was like elegant uh even the posts of this bed are like stone scroll work stone that's like better than any four poster bed you've seen in the home of any nobleman. Uh, there's even like an area where there looks to be like a wash basin and there's like trickling from perhaps a natural spring or something that seems to go into this wash basin. Is there anyone sleeping in the bed? No, you see no one in this room. Um, it doesn't look like anyone lives here or has lived here uh there's no furnishings like there's there's no personal effects there's no clothing there's no books on the shelves there's no items so maybe this is like a guest chamber maybe but an, an important question here are there rodents of abnormal size um do, if you guys want to look around the room you can you can you can all search around the room our oasis. I don't think they exist. Yeah, I'm gonna go ahead and search. Uh, Dirty twenty for investigation. Oops. On the crack. The the only thing that you see that isn't like stone made and built into the structure is a uh, treasure chest that is easily as tall as. Um, like any of the humans it's it's like six feet tall and like 10 feet wide so two um, estros by three estros it is made yeah but it is it is the only thing like made of wood that clearly is in this room that's not part of the the architecture um it has, like, it has like cool banded like iron banding around the the edges um and there is a sizable lock that looks like it has a key to it. We had a key from that uh, farmhouse we looked. It was really a complex key. Does this look like it would fit at all? No. Uh, this lock looks like if you tried to put that key in, your key would fall through and get lost inside of the lock. This, this padlock is like the size of your head. Yes, check for traps again. Okay, go ahead. Seven. <laughs> you do not see any traps. I guess um, try and hit the lock. Okay. Uh, so Durant is going to burn a uh, channel divinity knowledge of the ages uh, to pick up proficiency with thieves tools so that he can help Tuco. Ooh. Ooh. You dirty bastard. All right. Um, well, I guess that means Tuco gets advantage on this lock. So go ahead and make that roll roll. What, what role is that? Um, so you have proficiency in, in thieves tools, yes. right? Then not expertise. So you just add your dex bonus plus your proficiency bonus to the roll. 14, 17. Oh, but I get advantage. Yes. Yeah, 17. Okay. Um, you, it takes a while because some of your lock picks are, aren't even like long enough <laughs> to hit the tumblers, but like you mess around for a little while and like Durant's giving you pointers and you're like, how do you know how to do this priest? And he's like, "Never mind that. And then he like <laughs> suggests a few things and eventually you, you, you click it. And it, it seems to be something of a shock because the sound of the last tumbler clicking and then like the, the padlock kind of like sliding down surprises you. Uh, but it is unlocked. Well met. Thank you. So I guess try and open it up, see if we can see it inside. Okay. Um, again, because of flight, how long does this flying last? Uh, 
Is this the same exact spell as the flying spell? Is it different in the next yeah, it allows you to cast the fly, but uh, you know, one day four times. Ten minutes. Ten minutes. All right. So I'm going to say, like, you, you're still flying, okay? Which allows you to lift the lid. You open the lid, and inside is a horde of treasure. Um, you see piles of coins like you can't even believe. You see, like, human-sized things that look really cool, like, like gold goblets, just a set of them, you know? Um, but then you also see, like jewelry with a variety of gems um tons of gems jewelry coins and uh a pair of gloves uh arcana check the uh pair of gloves uh 16 they look interesting um they look different from like kind of from what you've you've seen um you know from like regular leather gauntlets or leather gloves uh they look like whatever skin they're made of whatever leather they're made of is not like cow leather for example it has sort of like a sheen to it. Um, Master, can you detect magic or identify what these are? Humphrey's like, oh, boy, can I ever. <laughs> Bring. Uh, Humphrey takes a few moments and uh, basically wastes the rest of your flying time to identify these gloves are gloves of swimming and climbing. Ooh. He's like, these are magnificent. He's like, I've, these are great specimens. They look very old, but uh, apparently still all the magical dreamer is still intact. Uh, do gloves count as armor? Uh, not towards your AC, but these gloves, if attuned to, will grant you some very specifically cool things. There are, again, no identifying marks for on anything in the chest. No. Because it'd and, be really kind of dumb if we took the king's stuff and tried to give it back to him. Yeah. yeah. There, there were no... The only runes outside of the room was like chamber of, of uh, sleeping. That was the best translation. I was hoping to find more information on how to wake the king or what he's doing sleeping or what wakes him up but we have treasure unfortunately there is not a large diary next to the bed so i don't know if we want to take any of this although the gloves are quite interesting i would like them very badly but i don't know if that's the right thing to do um humphrey's like I'm not the wisest man, but I am intelligent, and it would seem to be stupid to leave these gloves behind because they're gloves of climbing and swimming. Climbing. Climbing. Climbing and swimming. Climbing. I thought it was flying. No. Climbing and swimming. So they grant you... Um, While you're wearing these gloves and you have to attune to them, which is over the period of a, of a short rest, um, climbing and swimming don't cost you extra movement. And you gain a plus five bonus to athletics checks that you make when you are climbing or swimming. I think Google would like those then. He asks uh, Master Humphrey if it would be all right. Mm, Humphrey's like, I don't know. I don't know if it's our place to take those. What do you think, Riff? Uh, 
Griff also is not very wise. All right, fine. Yeah. He looks back at Durant. Durant's going to cast Augury. And I don't know, use some of the chalices to, to read, uh, you know. Nicely done. Read the, uh, the portents. Uh, now, I do get three questions, I believe. So first question is going to be, is there danger in taking the gloves? Um, no. Okay. Uh, second is, does my destiny await above? <laughs> uh, Which is uns- very generic. And <laughs> uncertain. <laughs> <laughs> I get what I get. I mean, I'm just throwing away questions here. Um, oh, no, instead of uncertain, the answer is perhaps. <laughs> uh and the last one is um, Will Riff be reunited with his father? Uh, how would I'm trying to think of how, how a magic eight ball would answer that? It is likely. <laughs> it is likely. <laughs> it is likely. Ask, ask again later. <laughs> were, you, were you asking the gloves or what were you asking? I no. was. Re- I was reading uh, the chalices in the chest. Okay. Um, yeah, Riff, Riff on second thought went to go like ask him or, or what he thought. Like he just for just for um, just for the heck of it, sort of. And, and um, it's been a while. He 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 holds the the gloves in his hand and he he feels. Uh, the back of his neck, um, which has given him some strange uh, results on this journey to see if any you feel any nothing or anything. You feel no personal connection to these gloves or anything in this treasure chest, and you notice that Humphrey has just been kind of taking a very careful accounting of every single gem, and he's he's kind of taking them out and setting them aside and just examining them, and he's like so keeping these gems or not keeping them? What, what, what think you? Uh, Durant is going to make an investigation check to see if there are any diamonds in the jewels. You don't need to make a check because Humphrey is so precisely laid out every single one of these gems that you could see all of them in the uh, uh, Discord chat that I just posted. <laughs> um. There are no diamonds, but there are many other valuable gems. And um, Humphrey says, guys, I understand if we don't want to carry around hundreds of thousands of pieces of copper. That makes sense. But we would be fools not to take all of these gems. So I'll do that Mm. for us. And he scoops them all into (laughs) a magical bag that you didn't know he has. And then he tightens it around his, his belt line. And he goes, if Master is oh, taking the gems, I'm going to take the gloves. Yes, take the gloves, especially since we can't fly anymore. Yeah, Riff hands them back to Tuco and he's like, yeah, keep these with you. Learn them. Wear them at night. Get to know them. They are not giant size anyways. <laughs> no, in fact, they, they were not. They were regular hum- medium humanoid sized uh, Loves. You, oh, that's a first level spell. I guess because it would make sense that Humphrey's curious about things, he would cast this again. So after detect, casting Detect Magic, he turns to Estroff and he says, did you make a potion? What's, what's that that you've got over there on you, buddy? Well... I, I do not know. It kind I of looks like a, like a wheat beer. Hmm. And then you, <laughs> you hear him mutter some words and he like points a finger like this and um, he says, that's a, you made a potion. What is it? It, uh, 
it seems to grant resistance to necrotic damage. And it's up here. That would mean like, you know, if, if an undead creature perhaps, or some other kind of vile, evil magic using sort of creature that could do necrotic damage with its attacks. That would be a, a useful thing to have. Yes. So with that, you guys are in the sleeping chamber. Um, as I said, only the treasure chest contents like and the chest itself were the only things that weren't part of the built-in architecture of the room. Um, it is quiet on this floor. You don't seem to, to hear anyone else. Uh, the flying spell that you had active has burned off, but you, you feel pretty good about the fact that you were able to to make it up now to level five. Only seven levels to go. <laughs> so, um, yeah. so where is it that you guys would intend to go? Do you, would you, would you leave this room and proceed up the stairs to the next level? I think so. Unless uh, I'm, it's only been like an hour or so since we, Slept, right? Mm -hmm. Yeah. Okay. There's nothing else on this level, right? You do not see anything else on this level. So as you guys leave the sleeping chamber, um, you walk over towards the stone stairs. You you have your lantern and um, I don't know, maybe maybe Humphrey casts a light spell on his staff, and you guys look up at the stone stairs as they seem to ascend um, to yet another level. And that is where we'll end this episode of D&D with Dads. Tune in for the next episode to find out what are, what's, what's on the levels above. I mean, what are we running into here? What shall the party encounter? Find out by subscribing, liking, and hitting that notifications bell so that you don't miss the next episode. Thanks everybody for your support. Peace out. It's me, Wizzy. I'm back once again to remind you to subscribe and click on the notifications button and also watch videos that are over there. And then don't forget to tune in to the next episode of whatever show you are just watching and crafting videos and DM tips and pro tips for vlogging and all sorts of gaming things.